All right, welcome to another uh, episode of Tim Rambles On About All Things Wine. Um, so what I want to talk about now is a juice clarification. So we just talked about pressing, the advantages and disadvantages of different types of presses, and how those presses are going to change the way wine tastes. Well, uh, once we get juice, we've got to do something with it. You know, you can just press juice straight to barrel, uh, which we've done before uh, and we've done successfully, but there are some issues that can come with just pressing straight to barrel, meaning mainly that there's a lot of solids that we end up leaving in the bottom of the barrel uh, and lots of yield issues later on. And there can be so how would we measure clarification? Say we wanted to actually have some reasonable measure. So one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, measurement of clarity. Uh, and we can do that with a thing called a turbidimeter, and they're primarily one that we use are NTUs, uh, nephilometric turbidity units. I uh, use the most used, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And basically the way that it works is that you uh, shine a light through uh, a, a cell, and however much scattering there is, that will give you a reading of how either cloudy or not cloudy something is. So this is how the measurement works. We have a lamp, we have a scatter detector, and then this lets us know uh, how much light either does or doesn't get through the sample and then how much of it gets scattered. So how clear is clear? This is uh, some different juice levels that are clarified to different levels. So 0 to 25 is pretty clear in terms of juice world. Uh, it's much lower than this when we talk about wine. Wine, we start talking below 5 uh, NTUs. But in terms of juice, uh, we want to talk about bigger numbers because this is going to be what we determine our clarity to be before we ferment. So 0 to 25 is pretty clear. 25 to 50 is a pretty light haze. 50 to 75 is a light haze. 75 to 125 is hazy. 125 to 250 is murky. And 250 plus is, oh, is kind of opaque. So when we are thinking about fermentation, um, highly clarified grape juice can be challenging to ferment. Uh, and we might want to choose a different level uh, than that when we go ahead and initiate our fermentation. So why we want to talk about solids is, again, highly clarified juice can be difficult to ferment. Um, when you have really, really clear juice, so if we like basically more or less sterile filtered our juice um, and settle it really clearly down to maybe 10 NTUs or less, there's nothing for the yeast to sit on. They're stuck on the bottom of the tank. tank. It's not like Yeast have little arms and legs and they can swim around perfectly. Uh, they kind of get trapped at the bottom. And that can be really hard if they're trapped. They don't have anything to sit on. They're stuck at the bottom. That means the, the it's harder for them to access all the nutrients, all the everything that's in the juice that allows us to have, uh, you know, flavor. Uh, so we don't have anything for the yeast to sit on. It's just not the best uh, scenario. Um so some yeast solids are going to help yeast kinetics. It helps them. Uh, it helps them to be, you know, some little happy yeast. Uh, they'll bud and they'll be thrilled. And um, so when we have some solids, that's going to help us have a better fermentation. On the other hand, if we have too much solids, uh, what can happen is the yeast can get trapped underneath the solids and they can, you know, lead to some reductive and funky uh, uh, fermentation aromas. So dialing in our uh, NTUs, dialing in our clarity can be really helpful. So to give you an idea where we to try to dial in is we want most of our fermentation somewhere, like our Sauvignon Blanc, we go pretty clear uh, down to about uh, 25 to 30 NTUs. Uh, and we're kind of stirring the tank and we're making sure we can do everything we can to make sure that fermentation stays active. Um, but for our Rome whites, we go a little bit higher solids, usually uh, 50 to 75 NTUs. Uh, and we're dialing that in pretty specifically with uh, flotation, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, so settling is kind of the old school way that we would do this. Um, and large quantities of solids can be generated during presses, pressing. So in order from the lowest amount of solids to the highest is a whole bunch versus distimmed versus distimmed and crushed, distimmed and crushed with axial feeding and dejuicing and a screw press. The more yield you get, the more solids you're going to get, uh, which is just the way it goes. Um, and then after that, we allow our solids to settle. Um, and really frequently, if we were to say the traditional method, we add some enzymes. We add pectinase enzyme that breaks down the pectin. It, it thins the juice, lowers the viscosity of the juice, and then it settles. Uh, and then we rack off that settled juice. We get it cold, and then it settles, and then when we're ready to, we rack it off, we warm up, and we ferment. Or the more modern tank take is to do flotation, which is where we take the juice and we, we literally float all the junk to the top of the container and then we rack off the bottom. And then if there's anything that's left that's really solid and gross, uh, we might rack it off and mechanically separate uh, that really, really dirty stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about different ways we can do that. So here's old school settling. Pretty simple. 
put the juice in a tank, add pectinase enzyme to reduce the viscosity, and then it allows settling just to naturally happen with gravity. And then we rack that clean juice off uh, of the tank. And uh, we go ahead and just take this part right here. We take the clean stuff off. We put it in another tank over here uh, where we got nice clean juice. And then we may choose to take a little bit of these fluffy leaves to dial in those NTU. So we might mix that in here to get a little bit more uh, uh, flotation or uh, better situation for um, our, our yeast to ferment. So we're just trying to get something for the yeast to sit on. Um, and then we generally take the gross leaves and we kind of dispose of them. and Or maybe we take them and we'll... Uh... Now the other side of the thing is we can do flotation. And flotation is a little bit different. Uh, here are the mechanics. These are the things that you need. And this is what we do right here. And this is ours in the cellar. Uh, there are some other videos out there on YouTube. I recommend you look them up. So in our case, we have a pump, uh, which you can see here. And we have our pump. And then what we have is we have the juice uh, coming out of the bottom of the tank. So it's going this way. And then what we do is we have our wine going this way. And right here in this area, I'm going to change my... Uh, ink color a little bit here so we can see this better. So what we have here is we have our diffusion stone right here. So this is a diffusion stone and this is the nitrogen is going in here. So we're injecting nitrogen in here into the must and then the nitrogen is getting caught in this hose right here which is basically what I call an expansion chamber. And so what's happening is the, the, the juice and the diffused nitrogen are getting put together. They're getting smashed into this hose and this valve is partially closed in order to build a little bit of pressure. And then the diffused nitrogen and juice goes into the tank and then the nitrogen just naturally wants to bubble up. And that's basically what's going on. So we've got the juice coming out the bottom and then we have it going so finding in the juice phase, um, which is what we might do in this case, is this is the order that we're going to do things in. So the first thing is, is we need a tank full of pressed juice. Check. The other thing we're going to need is some pectinase. Again, check, just like we normally do in settling, because we want to reduce that viscosity. Then the other things we can do, and these all are sort of, you know, you know optional little guys here. Um, you can use these as your flotation agents. The one that I find most useful is some sort of gelatin, and gelatins can be across a broad base. They don't always have to be from animals. Uh, they've got some great vegetarian gelatins these days from peas and potatoes and all kinds of other stuff. And so what basically happens is we add the pressed juice and then some fining agent, and this is when we come over here and we take our, our, our juice and we just start doing that pumping action I was talking about where we, we take our now have our clarified juice and we're pumping that juice with compressed gas and what will happen is, is all the stuff, all those solid leaves, instead of falling to the bottom, they go up to the top of the tank. And uh, it, it's a very uh, unique process, and I'm very pleased with what happens. Now, the reason I'm so pleased with it is, you notice some of these other items, you might have heard me talk about PVPP, carbon, bentonite, but primarily PVPP, carbon, and gelatin, these are fining agents. And what's great about these is they grab onto tannins. So what we were talking about earlier in press uh, decisions is like, you know, you don't want to use axial fed, you know, skin contact, all this stuff, because you're going to pick up phenolics, you're going to grip, it's not going to be good for the wine. Well, you can mitigate all this with flotation. So you can take the junkiest, crappiest juice in the world, and you can add whatever you need very technically, remove the compounds you don't want, and not only do you get clarified juice, you can get clarified super high quality juice like you get from whole bunch pressing uh, with perfect fruit uh, out of maybe some moderately moldy, not so great, fruit that was run through screw press and you can clarify it and get really high quality juice. And so this is what it looks like. Um, and again, uh, those additions that we're going to add, that pectinase to thin the juice, then we add the gelatin, the PVP, the carbon, the bentonite, and then eventually you create a raft, uh, kind of like doing a consommé for those of you that are chefs, and all that stuff floats to the top. So all the grape solids, all the junk, all the fining agents, all the mold, all the bad microbes, they get floated right to the top of the tank and you get left with clean juice on the bottom. So let me show you some options for flotation. And so we uh, did some different tubes uh, at different times. So the left is a press fraction. 
uh, some Riesling, and then we did 20, 40, 60, and 90 minutes of clarification. And, then, and this sat on the counter for a little while, so which is why you see the solids eventually, what little bit of solids we did have fall to the bottom. But, uh, you know, we can very much dictate just how much solid we want, um, so we can do that. Another thing we can do, too, is if we're looking to modify the phenolic content of our wine, we can do nitrogen or oxygen. So if we're doing Sauvignon Blanc, uh, we can we can do the juice with nitrogen and keep it crystal clear and green all the way through. But say we have a variety that's a little bit more tannic, a little more grip, something like Viognier, which is really hard to press, really tannic. But most of the aromatics in Viognier aren't really oxidizable. Most of them are pretty well glycosylated. And a lot of the aroma and flavor compounds come from the skins in Viognier. So uh, we might you know really press the guts out of our Viognier, uh, and then use oxygen as our flotation device. And then uh, the reason why that's important is oxygen will cause uh, phenolics to brown. So you see that brown color? What you're looking at there is very realistically tannin. The tannin is still there in the nitrogen treatment. It's still there, but because it hasn't browned, because it hasn't started tanning, um, it hasn't started aggregating, uh, it's still there. And so if you were to taste those two juices the same side by side, the nitrogen juice, uh, if it was a finished wine, would actually have tannin. The oxygen juice, if it was the exact same wine, uh, the tannin will have oxidized, and then it will aggregate, which you're seeing in the, the browning, and then it will precipitate. It'll end up at the bottom of the barrel. And so you end up with a wine that ends up silkier and softer. So not only can you modify the wine using fighting agents, you can then use a different inert gas to then further modify the wine. So if you want to talk about getting really technical stylistically with white wine, um, flotation is a new frontier. And uh, for the rest of you, you're probably going, what the heck is this guy rambling on about? It took, me, it took me 20 years to get to the point where I'm getting my jollies about this. Uh, I, I think at some point in time, you're going to look back on this and go, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, but for me, uh, I think this has been one of the most amazing revolutions to come through for a wine production. So next year, uh, this fall, we're actually gonna do an in triplicate trial. We've been sponsored for it by the Washington State Wine Commission to do uh, exactly this trial. And so we're gonna do nitrogen versus oxygen versus traditional settling. And so I would expect in EB204 or 205, we'll have a very detailed conversation about uh, this. So again, just another glancing, let it wash over you, uh, but uh, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, you know, really technical uh, industry moving stuff that we're, we're working on. So flotation, the real advantage is it's done at room temp. There's no heating or cooling required. It saves a ton of energy. Check. It can remediate mold and rot and phenolic issues in the juice phase. And let me repeat this over and over again. Anything you do in the juice phase will be far less noticeable than if you were to do it in the wine phase. So if you find in the juice phase, you won't notice it in the wine. You find in the wine phase, you will notice it. Um, so everything we want to do in the juice that we can do, that's fantastic. So check, we can clean up bad problems. Uh, we can clean up those phenolics from aggressive pressing, check. Again, we save a huge amount of time. Uh, it's two hours of flotation time versus one to two days for cold settling. If you're in production winemaking, you can save a day on a turn on a tank. That is huge. And lastly, the most important part is we get higher yields. Check mate. Um, downside is it's eight o'clock. You just finished pressing. The great thing is about cold settling is once you got done pressing, you could just hit the chiller and go home. That's it. The other disadvantage is you're using more product. Um, you know, you're, if you're, you're you know, doing non-interventionist, minimal handling, minimal anything, uh, flotation isn't your jam. Um, so maybe you want to do something a little more traditional. But um, I do see uh, some, you know, some, some disadvantages in that respect that you have to use more product. And if you're going to label your product, it's probably important to do that uh, in a reasonable way. However, that being said, all the gelatins and everything that you use in this phase probably wouldn't have to be put on the label because they're all going to disappear uh, by the time it becomes wine, especially if you sterile filter the wine, there won't be anything there. Uh, so that's why wine's so tricky about labeling because many of the things that we use as processing aids don't actually ever end up in the bottle. All right, I want to take about gross lees. And now gross lees can be a couple of different things. It can be either the stuff that floated to the top in flotation or the stuff that fell to the bottom of the tank. So what do you do with all these leftovers? So I want to talk about mechanical juice separation. So what do you do with all the sludge at the bottom of the tank? I mean, it's sludge. It's mostly water. Um, 
what are you going to do with it? Or not water, it's good quality juice. What are you going to do with it? So I want to talk about lees filtration. So based on a 100 ton white winery, um, and so this would be, you know, College Cellars is about a 25 to 30 ton white winery uh, in a big year, more like 20 tons. So, you know, you'd have to be a fairly big white winery, but um, take you take a lease filter, which is where you could filter out all the, the gross solids and recover some wine. And what if you could reduce your losses by 50%? So if we did 100 times times 150 gallons, we're looking at 15,000 gross gallons. And then, you know, we're going to lose somewhere around 10 to 15% of that. So your current loss of gross lees, you're throwing down the drains about 2,250 gallons a year, which is a tremendous amount of just gross lees to throw down the drain. So let's talk about recovering it. Say we recover half of it and we can get $10 a gallon on the bulk wine market. Um, we basically pay for our lease filter in one year. Um, but say you could sell it for just $10 a bottle um, and you were getting $7 a bottle minus your cork bottle and everything else, um, you could find basically $40,000 in found wine. And uh, lease filters can pay for themselves really, really quickly. The question is, do you want to deal with it? Uh, and that's the question for many small wineries. Is it easier for you just to put it down the drain or compost it? Uh, or is it easier for you to try to put it through a lease filter? Um, and do you have the time and capacity to do that? And I think that's the bigger issue for many small wineries is just having the time and capacity to deal with it. Uh, but big wineries definitely know how to deal with it. So let's talk about the different ways that we can do it. Um, I'll post up some videos online of RDVs uh, being caked and used. So these are called rotary drum vacuum filters. And the way that they work is these are a big giant rotating drum. So picture the, the drum on the right is rotating uh, clockwise. And so in the bottom of, that you can't see, there'd be a tray in the bottom full of lees, uh, you know, gross lees wine. And that filter rotates. And as it rotates, um, there's a big cake on the outside that's made out of diatomaceous earth. And uh, on the left, you can see somebody pre-coating one of these. And so you use, you know, bags and bags and bags of diatomaceous earth and you coat the filter on the outside uh, and make this big cake around the outside. And then it's all being done through vacuum. So this big drums under vacuum, it sucks the cake to the vacuum, to the, the filter. And as it rotates, uh, eventually after you've created the cake, you start adding wine to the bottom and the wine gets sucked up into this diatomaceous earth and all the leaves get stuck to the outside and as it rotates the uh, there's a knife on the outside edge so you see that kind of silver piece with all the stuff falling off that is the 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 shavings and all the junk that's getting shaved off and that reveals a new uh, amount of diatomaceous earth to the bottom of the filter then it goes through uh, it goes down and contacts the, the, the Lee's wine and it sucks that Lee's wine through to make clear wine. And I think if I, when you see the video I'll post up, it'll make a lot more sense. But this is pretty much the way that we've been doing for 50 years to recover Lee, you know, Lee's in large wineries. Um, and in large wineries, they want to do this because uh, putting things down the drain is hard. And in a lot of larger wineries, they're processing all their own wastewater. And so they don't want to put anything down the drain if they don't have to. So this is circa 1950s technology uh, for uh, Lee's uh, recovery, but there are modern ways that are a little bit better. Um, centrifuges have come on really, really strong. Uh, this is a uh, very common practice as well now. So basically what you do is you feed the juice in through the bottom. It spins really, 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 really fast. And then solids you know, come out the side and then the clear juice uh, stays in the middle. And uh, they're very effective. They're loud as heck, um, but they do a pretty good job of clarifying uh, Lee's uh, juice. Uh, so this is another way to save that, that juice. And so big wineries uh, pretty much all have either an RDV or a centrifuge or uh, whatever I'm going to show you next. But one of the things I'll tell you about centrifuges that's really nice is they're really good for arresting fermentation. For the big Riesling producers in Washington, they use centrifuges. So when they're trying to stop a fermentation, that's like trying to stop a freight train. Trying to get a tank cold is really hard and trying to arrest yeast is really hard. So if they're trying to stop a ferment that's rolling, uh, they run it through a centrifuge and centrifuge out 90 plus percent of the yeast and that'll arrest the fermentation. Then all I have to do is get the tank cold and they won't uh, have to use as much refrigeration or chemical usage to stop that. So uh, also used as well. Uh, but these are other ways to recover that Lee's wine or Lee's juice. And the new thing is uh, high solids cross flows, and this is going to replace RDVs entirely uh, because uh, these are amazing. And so you pump the leaves in, 
and you get sludge out the other side and clear juice uh, right through that you can go straight to ferment with. And the, the big deal is with this is there's nothing to deal with. So remember I talked about diatomaceous earth, those rotary jump vacuum filters, you end up with bins and bins and bins of leftover diatomaceous earth that a lot of landfills won't even take. So you end up with these, you know, basically big piles of stuff behind your winery that you can't deal with. So uh, this is uh, pretty much going to be the future of, uh, of wine. So a big fan of these as we move forward. But these are just ways to also clarify and save some of that juice in the long run. So let's do uh, some clarification and review. You can really influence your style by how clean or dirty your juice is, and it can be a measurable uh, using and to use if you want to do it that way. So for big wineries that uh, you know you don't have time to be on the floor testing everything, you're you know pushing things through. You could just tell your cellar staff to you know clarify your wine to seventy you know juice to seventy NTUs, and they'll clarify it. And as soon as it's at that number, they got a handheld turbidimeter. They Check it, turn off the turbidimeter or turn off their uh, the flotation machine, and then they rack to the tank and start ferment immediately. So you could really spec your wine uh, as well. Uh, cold settling is the traditional method, uh, and most wineries I still think use that. Um, I think once people discover how good uh, flotation is, I, most people I know that work in big wineries have discovered it over the last four or five years. Uh, they have all jumped on board with flotation, and I'm right there. Uh, it's, you know, flotation's gaining steam for good reason. Less energy cost, uh, we can custom tailor our wine, we can remediate any issues, and we get quicker to ferment. And all of those things, less energy cost and quicker to fermentation, less labor costs, uh, that all adds up. So, uh, you know, if you can save a few pennies in the wine industry, that's a great thing to do. Um, and then also the ways to mechanically separate juice from solids. And, and I mean, some of you are probably asking, why would you flotation? Why would you do any of this when you could just run it through a centrifuge? Well, you could. You, you certainly could. Um, it's just slower. But yeah, you could. You could just run all your wine right through a centrifuge and uh, never use any of these techniques. Uh, but it, they, they aren't particularly quick. Uh, the flotation and a cold settling are even faster than running a fuge. But um, just something to, something to think about uh, as, as you move forward. So uh, cheers, and uh, maybe we can discuss this uh, next Wednesday if you guys have some more questions to get some more detail as we drill down on it. Cheers.